Harvard Divinity School. Religion and the Legacies of Slavery, a series of public online conversations. Reflecting on Religion and the Legacies of Slavery, March 20th, 2023. On behalf of our Dean David Hempton, welcome to our last in a series of six webinars on Religion and the Legacies of Slavery, co-sponsored by Harvard Divinity School, the Harvard Legacy of Slavery Initiative, and Harvard X. I'm Diane Moore, and I'm the Faculty Director of Religion and Public Life here at Harvard Divinity School. And it is my pleasure to co-host this series with my friend and colleague, Melissa Wood Bartholomew, Associate Dean for our Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. On behalf of us both and our many staff and faculty colleagues who have helped bring this series into being, we want to welcome the hundreds of participants who are joining us for this presentation this evening, representing over 80 countries and the thousands of people who have participated from around the world in the series as a whole. Uh, we are deeply moved by your interest and so grateful for your presence. Tonight is the sixth in a series of critical uh, conversations building upon and beyond the work of the Harvard 2022 Legacy of Slavery Report. In this series, we explore through the head and the heart what the academic study of religion teaches us about the tangled histories and legacies of slavery and racism here in the United States and beyond. These tragic legacies are alive and present in many forms as the news on any given day in any given hour devastatingly and consistently reveals. We hope that by gaining a deeper understanding of the complex power of religion relevant to historical and contemporary manifestations of racism and white supremacy, that this knowledge will enhance our commitments to reparative action and racial justice and healing in our own times and in our own context. Ultimately, these conversations are in service of advancing our vision of a just world at peace healed of racism and oppression. We pause. we pause out of reverence. We pause to acknowledge and honor those who came before us who were indigenous to this land and the African and indigenous people who were enslaved in this country, including the more than 70 people of African and indigenous descent who were enslaved here at Harvard University as detailed in the Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery report. As a descendant of Africans who've been enslaved in this country, I am aware of the potential impact of hearing this tragic history. We want to remind everyone that as we proceed through these difficult conversations and listen to the exchanges, it is important to be attuned to what might be stirring up in us, happening in our bodies, and particularly as we navigate our emotions regarding ongoing manifestations of the legacies of slavery in this country. So please remember to breathe and take care of yourself during and after this session. We invite you now to pause and breathe with intention and to focus on your breath as we lift up the Harvard University Native American Program's acknowledgement of the land and people. We acknowledge that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. But for the stolen land and the stolen labor, this country and this university would not be. Our acknowledgement of the land and people extends beyond words. It is expressed through our action and is connected to what we have been doing through these series, this conversation. The series is a part of the broader work stemming from our school's commitment to reading the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery Report as our common read text this year. As we engage with this report, we are discerning our institutional actions for redress and ways to support the university in implementing its recommendations and even expanding upon them. And we aim to further our vision of a restorative anti-racism, anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School and of a world healed of racism and oppression. 
This is sacred work. Thank you, Melissa. As all of you know, this is our last in this series and it we're um, highlighting it as a plenary conversation about, about what we've learned and the implications of what we learned for moving forward for, for us as members of the Harvard community. And we hope for you also as participants in this series. Before we turn uh, back to our panelists to have them introduce themselves uh, and, the, and, to, and to give an overview of the highlights of each of their sessions to bring us all up to speed, Melissa and I will both share some brief reflections about our hopes for the series and what we, why we embarked upon this, uh, on this adventure together. So I'm going to begin uh, by just saying that I had I have many hopes for this series, all of which were um, surpassed relevant to my to my um, my wildest dreams. But the hopes that I want to highlight for you now are three. I was hoping that we could promote the public understanding of religion in service of a just world at peace, which is the re religion and public life mission statement. And I was hoping we could do this through giving audience members opportunities to better understand the enormous and complex power of religion in human experience. As we learned through this series, religion has always functioned and continues to function to promote the full range of human agency from heinous crimes against humanity, such as slavery, to nearly unfathomable acts of courage, compassion, and moral imagination such as enacting reparations for stolen lands and labor. By understanding this power, we hope to give audience members tools to confront the harmful impacts of religion and to enhance the generative capacities in their own lives and contexts, whether they identify as religious or not. And a second hope was to challenge common misrepresentations of religion by demonstrating how religions are internally diverse as opposed to uniform how they evolve and change over time as opposed to being ahistorically static and how religious influences are embedded in all aspects of human experience, including so-called secular arenas and cannot be contained within the quote unquote private sphere of individual belief and ritual practice. These are common assumptions about religion that we hope that we dispelled um, in our conversations throughout this series. And finally, I hope that the series has inspired audience members to realize that their human agency matters in shaping cultures and contexts where myri the myriad legacies of slavery can be diminished and where the process of reparative action and racial and justice healing can commence. So thank you for your attention to, uh, to this series and to all that we've learned from you and with you through the conversations that we've had in the chat and also through responses to the questionnaire that we sent out to, to you a couple of weeks ago. And many of you responded to that questionnaire and we'll be responding to those responses as the evening progresses. And I'll turn it over now to you, Melissa. Thank you, Diane. And I echo the gratitude. Uh, this has been an extraordinary series. And along with the series being a tool for educating the broader global community, my hope was that it would also help HDS and Harvard understand more deeply the university's connection to slavery and the horrific race science of justified slavery and the role of religion, all in furtherance of our work of redress and repair. It has served as an additional offering for our HCS community to engage in the slavery report alongside our common read conversations. And indeed, this series has strengthened our foundation for understanding the broad scope of the work of repair, specifically regarding the race science that Harvard advanced and su that supported slavery, racial segregation, and fueled systemic racism around the globe. Racism that continues to flourish today within systems, institutions and individuals. The work of repair must include a focus on the psychological implications of the race science and the role that religion has played in advancing the race science and racism, and specifically the role of scholars and professors of religion, ministers, religious leaders and leaders broadly working towards repair. This requires being attentive 
to the personal work of addressing the impact of this harmful science and distortions of religion on our own formation, the way we see ourselves and each other, and specifically the way we see Black people. I hope that we have created an atmosphere for an honest reckoning within ourselves so that we can create a space where we're breaking our soul ties to slavery. Deepening our understanding of the relationship between religion and racism and slavery and the role of religion in promoting the myths supported by race science and our understanding of our divinity school's ties to this history underscores our commitment to embedding this work of repair into every part of our work here at the Divinity School. This includes the work to not only transform our school into a restorative anti-racism, anti-oppressive HDS, but to help train our students who are going out into the world as scholars of religion, ministers and leaders to ensure that they are equipped with this knowledge. This will prepare them for the work of eradicating racism and oppression out in the world at the intersection of religion and social change in whatever area of scholarship ministry, leadership, religious or otherwise, they are engaged in to advance just peace and the vision of a world healed of racism and oppression. Diane. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm gonna ask our faculty colleagues to join on screen right now and I'm going to ask them to please provide two to three takeaways that you hope that audience members would have learned or heard in your presentation. And I'm just gonna uh, introduce you all briefly in the order uh, that, you present, that you presented with the titles of your presentations. Um, and then I'm just gonna turn it over to each of you to, to respond to that question in order of, of appearance, beginning with you, Karen. So Karen King started us off um, in the series with a session entitled Enslavement in the Formation of Earliest Christianity. And David Holland followed Karen in conversation with Catherine Jin Lum on religion, race, and the double helix of white supremacy. Dan McCannon then offered a session entitled Harvard Divinity School and Slavery Family Stories, followed by Terrence Johnson, who made a presentation on memory, history, and the ethics of reparations. And Tracy Hux, uh, finished our individual presentations in conversation with Dane and Constance Perry in a session entitled Slavers and Slavery, a Dialogue with Descendants. So thank you all of you for those incredibly rich presentations individually. And we're very excited about hearing your, um, reminding us of the takeaways from your session and then engaging in conversation among all of us about what we all learned from each other uh, and what we plan to do moving forward from this from this encounter. So Karen, please uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank everyone uh, again so much for the time and the attention that you've given us. As an historian of early Christianity, I wanted to focus out of my own expertise on several points and among them, important to me was making it clear that Christianity was formed and its scriptures were written in a society where slavery was ubiquitous. And that has had several really important kinds of consequences. It's important to know, first of all, that the Bible does not have a single coherent or consistent message about enslavement, but its materials have been interpreted and lived out in many ways. And that has that has several consequences. One is that people are therefore accountable for how they interpret, use, and live out the teachings of the Bible. So people who are, um, have used it to justify slavery or were themselves enslavers or who still use it to justify dehumanizing treatment of any person or group on whatever basis are accountable for the harm that's done. It's important to know that this Bible doesn't tell a single story. There's always a danger of a single story. Um, the Bible has been used also to nurture a theology of a God who shares in pain and suffering, who requires justice and kindness, and who opposes enslavement and its legacies. So it matters what stories are told. It matters that they are diverse, they are complex, and that they're true. Thank you. And I'll echo Karen's appreciation for the organizers of this series and for the viewers and participants who have really enriched my own understanding through their questions and observations. 
The central concern of my discussion with Catherine Jin Lum lay in the importance of recognizing that the modern category of race and the practices of racism have not been, as some scholars have influentially suggested, solely the product of self-consciously secularized or even secularizing scientific worldviews. Rather, Catherine argues that the constituent components of racism, including the points of connection between racialized thinking and slavery and its legacies, carried historical baggage attributable to racialized traditions of human othering. Most notably, she sees not just an analogous pattern, but an actual causal relationship between Christian traditions that divided the world into the saved and the heathen, and a colonizing white supremacist view of humanity that divides the world between those who rightly wield power and those who are the rightful subjects to that power. If we are to unravel these devastating legacies, we need to have a clear understanding of their origin stories. And the study of religion is an appropriate, maybe the appropriate disciplinary site for an exploration of the connection between binary religious thinking and the power dynamics of racialized colonialism especially as it relates to the Atlantic system of African slavery and its enduring consequences. For a place like Harvard, it is especially important to note that this binary connects to the Western Academy's long patterns of similarly dividing the world into the studiers and the studied. Awareness of the history of heathenizing also draws attention to another problematic assumption in the discourse about race and slavery. And that is the notion that beliefs which hold one's racialized characteristics to be changeable are necessarily more humane in substance and consequence than beliefs in racial immutability. Professor Lum has worked to help, has worked to help us understand that belief in changeability, what in a religious sense we might call convertibility, can be just as destructive and deadly. And indeed, it was the concept of convertibility that often served as the initial justification and longstanding explanation for European and American slave systems. In a contemporary frame, this work helps us understand both the sources and the implications of the phenomena that today get tagged with the title of white saviorism. At a few points in the discussion, Catherine and I grappled with the ethical question of what this history means for those who want to pursue productive aims and interventions in the world, but do not want to perpetuate the toxic racializing or colonizing paternalism that often stows away in the baggage or even on the face of such efforts. As our exchanges suggested, that is a profoundly challenging question, but among the answers that come out of this conversation is that any hope at addressing it must begin with a clear-eyed awareness of this history and its persistent influences. Finally, I would note that for the field of religious studies, this work teaches by example the importance of recognizing the transformability of historical categories and the importance of avoiding a trap of colonialist scholarship that would fail to see the agentive actions of those who were labeled heathen, turning that very category into an instrument of their own anti-racist activity. So much more could be said about this complex and influential history, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you all so much. It's uh, such a delight to be part of this challenging, deep conversation, and I'm very grateful uh, to everyone who's had a hand in making it possible. In my presentation, I shared some of the things that I learned from the slavery report about how slavery um, was connected to the lives of Harvard Divinity School's founding professors, students, and donors. And what I learned is that these people were much more implicated in the international slave trade uh, than most other New Englanders of their generation. Just because new slavery was officially abolished in New England did not mean that the founders of Harvard Divinity School were not implicated. Uh, specifically, many of these founding families uh, were very were among the Americans most involved in the French uh, slave-based colonies of both the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean. Um, that's where the donors made their wealth, and that is um, the wealth behind the families of many of the early faculty and students. And I looked at these family stories through the lens of moral injury. Uh, Divinity School affiliated people like 
William Mallory Channing and Thomas Wentworth Higgins, who were deeply opposed to slavery, but they grapple throughout their lives in very complex ways with the fact that their fathers or grandfathers had made their fortunes uh, through enslavement. Uh, and one of the things that I really discovered as I explored those stories is that people who experienced that sort of moral injury, even as they took courageous steps in opposition to slavery, continued to live in a moral universe that centered whiteness and that centered the experiences of people like them. Uh, and in many ways, uh, contributed to a legacy at the Divinity School of centering certain experiences, moral injured experiences, more than the physical injuries of people who were enslaved. And this brought me to a lot of reflection about Harvard's endowment, uh, uh, because while the stories of our ancestors are very ethically complex, in many ways, uh, the financial wealth that they left to institutions like Harvard is not ethically complex. It's very much a product of the theft of labor, the theft of land, uh, the exploitation of people. And so I close by inviting all of us uh, to think about strategies of reparation that involve a complete transformation of the power structure uh, and the work of Harvard Divinity School and Harvard University as a whole. Great. Uh, thank you, Dan, and to my colleagues. And again, I uh, want to acknowledge the um, organizers of this event and also to share my gratitude with the audience for your participation. So this is actually something very new for me in terms of my research. Um, I've thought about reparations for a long time and have wanted to dive into it, but for very various reasons, I always put it on the shelf. And so in many respects, I'm very grateful uh, for this opportunity to share some of my developing thoughts. And I really wanted to sort of create a kind of framework for how we actually might engage the very topic of reparation. Um, many of us come to the topic assuming that this is something that was a debate started in the 70s or a debate started by frustrated African Americans, you know. And in fact, you know, we see since the very um, eight, you know, early emancipation period, right? That people are, 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 are contemplating and, and wrestling with this idea of what do, so what do we owe, right, um, the formerly enslaved? And so there's a long history uh, of de debating uh, reparations in this country. And I wanted to situate some of my ethical argument with that, with that basic starting point. And then I really want to show that in light of this historical starting point, that it shows that a very viability of reparations, right? The fact that we have been debating, right, engaging, trying to make sense of the harm that's been done to, to these human beings, that to me, it sets the very stage for a viability. Often people have said, look, there's no political currency in this conversation. And yet I wanted to show there actually is currency because there we have a, a roadmap, right? We have, as the young people will say, receipts in which, it, in which you know, learned folk, very lettered people have been arguing um, for reparations and, and for a certain kind of accountability. Um, and then I also really wanted to, in some ways, show how we can then sort of change the starting point for the conversation on reparations, right? The question necessarily isn't why it happened, right? But I want to move toward what uh, then President Ruth Simmons says to the question of to what do we owe these human beings and their ancestors? And that question, I think, recenters the debate and then lastly, I wanted to, in some ways, set the stage for institutions to begin thinking about what, um, is, what, what is their role in this whole conversation. And as one uh, friend once told me that, you know, an institution's budget reflects its moral imagination. And I really wanted to sort of generate, right, a conversation in which this is not simply a conversation about, you know, uh, reports or about, you know, going to the archives, right? We can do that, we can contemplate, we can debate, uh, we can piece together new information. But I believe we've come to a particular moment in history in which now we, as Dan said, must think about how then do we take this conversation, right? As a kind of starting point for reimagining, right? 
new institutional kind of cultures, new traditions, um, because without sort of practices of like, ha habit, right, without rethinking, right, what we take for granted, what's you know, fundamental about our institutions, i.e. the budget, then this conversation is simply an intellectual exercise that will not have any merit on the ground. Um, and so with that, I just want to, again, thank my colleagues for just pushing me in terms of my own sense of not only responsibility, but for engaging a uh, highly contested um, topic. Thank you, Taryn. And I also wanna thank the hosts for being invited to this very important conversation. I'm trained as a historian of religion and I have committed my work to disclosing invisible and muted histories. Uh, that's the work that I commit myself to. And in this conversation, it was about unmuting those conversations with uh, the descendants of those who were the slave traders, unmuting and, and unsilencing those histories of those who are descendants of, of the enslaved, and also being a part of this collective conversation of unmuting and unsilencing the history of slavery as it relates to Harvard University. Uh, one of the things that I wanted the audience to take away from this was this sense of our expanded notion of the geography of slavery, that it was not just a Southern phenomenon, that there was this notion of the deep North where slavery was entrenched in New England economy. I uh, really appreciate the report on the legacy of slavery when it states, quote, slavery thrived in New England from its beginnings and was a vital element of the colonial economy. So too was slavery integral to Harvard. And so I wanted it to, to, be, uh, to be widely known in terms of the ways we think about slavery and the geographies we think about slavery just to remember that the first enslaved people are coming into New England in 1638 and not forget that 200 year uh, history of enslaved African presence uh, in New England and in, in the North. I also wanted a sense of what do we do with this dialogue and how do we engage in dialogues around this history? And Dane Perry offered us one approach to doing that, his, this notion of what sacred listening and he defined it as listening with an open heart and an open mind. It's important that we have an opportunity to say what we feel and also know that what we are saying is being heard. And I want to say that's not an easy thing because that listening requires listening to pain, to listening to shame, to listening to anger, to listening to guilt, to listening to trauma. And so it ultimately is about listening and engaging in dialogues that require courage from us to do that work. And finally, one of the things I thought that was really important that came out of the webinar that I did with Dane and Constance Perry was this need, particularly in the United States, for the importance of intra-white dialogue. There was many instances within the webinar where he directly talked to the audience and said, you know, specifically white people, I'm referring to white folks. You know, he said, quote, we don't know what we don't know with regard to race. And it's important that we take the time to learn and to understand the multi-generational trauma that particularly African-Americans, but all people of color live through in this country. And that multi-generational trauma is very significant. And the ignorance of white folks towards it is very significant. And so this sense of what does it mean to begin to have interracial conversations and dialogues among white people. And those of you who've written in talked about beginning that work, beginning that work in your churches. Uh, one participant wrote in saying that for the past seven years, she has gathered white women together to talk about what she calls uh, undoing our own racism. And so really wanting to have these cross-racial dialogues, but also wanting to emphasize in, in the webinar this sense for the importance of, of interracial dialogue as well. And this is so, so beautiful. Um, and so we want to, to hear you all engage with each other and we want to get engaged with all of you together. So given what we've all heard um, and what you just shared, what are your responses to the two questions that framed this series? And those two questions were, what does the academic study of religion teach us about the complex histories and legacies of slavery? And how can a deeper understanding of the roles of religion enhance our commitment to reparative action in our contemporary times? So those are our two initial questions. And Diane, I wanna just 
ask you if you can just start us off. Yeah, just a, just th first of all, thank you for the for those summaries. Um, they reminded me of the depth. I, I took extensive notes, but I again heard heard some new things in your retelling, and just and uh, and I'm just deeply grateful for for your for your for your thoughts and presentations. To to one one overarching theme I think comes to mind for me when I think about the importance of the study of religion and and what it can do what how it can help us um, understand the power of religion in a, in more nuanced ways than is common in public conversation um, in our work in religion and public life we we encounter and know that there are deeply embedded assumptions about religion that are just taken as true that are actually quite problematic um, and and are unquestioned. They're kind of self seeming to be self-evident truth. And for us, we realize that that's not because people aren't capable of understanding complexity. It's that there are very few opportunities for people to uh, be exposed to the study of religion um, as opposed to the experience of one's own faith community or none or uh, public conversation about religion that's often portrayed again through media or through journalism, which is not uh, it, the same as the study of religion. I think the one thing I wanna um, invite us to think about relevant to this conversation is that there's a common assumption that somehow religion is either a positive or a negative force. Um, and in fact, religion is both. Religion is, is a powerful force. That's, that's what we are trying to represent through this series and through religion and public life in general. And the danger of presuming that religion, having, having debates about religion as good or bad distracts us from the essential power of how religion is functioning, again, in both uh, terribly heinous ways, as we've seen in the history of this, of this conversation and the history of uh, the legacies of slavery relevant to religion. Uh, but also it, it distracts us again also from the, the incredible power that we can muster uh, and coalitions we can build across sectors relevant to uh, promising aspirations that religion can also inspire. So I think I just wanted to say that the study of religion helps challenge that binary of good or bad religion or that real religion is actually good, quote unquote, good religion, and that other forms of religion are somehow misrepresented or misinterpreted. The study of religion helps give more complexity to that and challenges that binary, and really ends with the fact that religion is powerful. How we as human beings decide to use that power is really within our capacity to, to decide. And I hope that through this conversation that all of us will uh, have better tools, including me, better tools to recognize that power and how it's functioning in our contemporary lives and to um, challenge the negative impacts of it and to and to enhance the positive. So so that's that's one take one important comment I wanted to make about the the power of religion and the study of religion. Can I just build on that, Diane, because sure. um, because this was one of the central important points about the way the Bible can be interpreted. Some people will say, oh, the Bible is pro-slavery. They read the Bible, they, they find that there. Okay, and so then that means either that that authorizes and justifies enslavement, or else they have to throw the whole thing out. And I think, right. you know, the, the, the important thing is to realize that we, we have a responsibility to understand and to really dig in deeply to the complexity of this literature that was written in a context of a society of enslavement, but to realize that it says multiple things, you know, and, you know, in the, in, in the talk, I, I, I talked about Paul, the letters of Paul, which are part of the important part of, of the New Testament, it, you know, they're really hard, <laughs> but he has trouble with them, but Paul says at least three things. You know, he says that there's neither slave nor free in Christ Jesus, so they don't apply, or Christ followers are not heirs, but they are slaves, or all people are enslaved. I mean, he sort of says it all. But, but you know, in, in a way, then what one does with that, the complexity of how one meets that, who does it and what it says um, is, is so important. So thank you for, for, for that, emphasizing that point. Thank you. 
If I could, Karen. One of the things that was so compelling from your talk was uh, the Negro Bible. And it distinguishes the work of, you know, interpreting and understanding the different stories within the Bible versus like this deliberate act that people went to the extreme, you know, measures of actually crafting a Bible, extracting books from the Bible, like Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, that highlight the beauty of blackness, for example, to especially design, you know, this, this Bible to underscore uh, oppression against black people to justify slavery. So like, it just strikes me this deliberate act. Um, and then, then the other point that you raised so powerfully was accountability. So this is helping to underscore the, the accountability of scholars of religion, ministers, uh, Christians specifically, who, um, who carry this legacy. And uh, to understand and appreciate the legacy and the impact of this deliberate act of trying to utilize, of utilizing the, the, the Bible, the word of God to justify enslaving the black people. That's a different, you know, exercise. I mean, so that was just really, really, really striking to me. Well, thank you for that. And I just, just to say, it is really astonishing how much had to be taken out you know, as well as right. <laughs> I think it's also, it's, it's striking in terms of like the, the responsibility and like the fact that we don't know that and that it's not a part of the regular discourse, the conversations in schools and churches and so forth. So it just adds to the, the, the level of responsibility that Christians, white Christians in particular have to this history, to dismantling this history and understanding the legacies of the, the, the longstanding psychological implications of this deliberate act. Um, so. Maybe I can just jump in there, um, Melissa and um, Karen, to, to note that this process or the desire to create a scripture in support of white supremacy is very much in keeping with something that came out of, uh, of our discussion uh, in our session, um, the idea that white supremacy is a belief system with its own symbols and doctrines and even rituals. And as you know it, with the desire to create even sacred texts um, in the process of, of the pursuit of its own power. So as a belief system that persists even in the face of vast amounts of evidence to the contrary, it's hard to imagine, actually, for me at least, an academic setting better equipped to analyze, deconstruct, and unravel the belief system of white supremacy than the study of religion, where doctrines and symbols and scriptures and ritual and interpretation and even potentially violent zeal have long been the object of inquiry within this field. And so white supremacy very much should be uh, an object of inquiry for students of religion. And also, if I can add, I think what's quite fascinating, and I, I learned this from my teacher, Karen King, in terms of when I was a graduate student here, sort of the multiple ways in which we, we, we use hermeneutics, right, to interpret sacred texts. And so I think religion and opens a possibility for reimagining, right, like the starting point for how we engage sacred texts, right? Um, the assumption is that we read the text for many Protestants and you're, you're seeking something from it. There's an entire set of histories and undisclosed debates that have happened that, that inform how we read. So part of what I think we've done is really force people to sort of rethink, how do I engage religion? How do I then um, challenge the starting points in which I engage religion, right? I think categories like whiteness, white supremacy, while we hear them regularly, we, we've yet to really, I think, um, decode them in public debate. And I think we've attempted to say, lay a, a groundwork for rethinking, okay, we can't take religion for granted as this personal individualistic encounter with the divine, right? That there are these multiple histories that we have to contend with and lots of debates. And I think the more that we learn and, and disclose the debates that happened, right? Say, for example, in the Pauline letters, for example, I think the greater our capacity when to hear, right, new evidence, but also the greater capacity, right, I think to, to then move and shift and expand how we use the text and, and to think about it in terms of community and, and to think about it in a much broader perspective. 
one of the things that I would add is, you know, the great historian of religion, uh, Albert Rabateau, the late Albert Rabateau, you know, said that religion and particularly Christianity for the enslaved was a double-edged sword. And so how do we come up with authentic and truthful stories that really talk about that double-edgedness of that? How do we restory the history? How do we begin to advance knowledge that begins to speak truthfully about the complicity with religion, slavery, you know, and the rise of modernity, that they were, they were moving hand in hand? How do we then interrogate some of the theologies and the theological anthropologies that developed about Black people, the evilness of Blackness? And how do we begin to do that work honestly, truthfully, in, in within the context of the study of religion? But also, I would say, how do we embrace the interdisciplinarity and the transdisciplinarity of the work that we do? Um, so one of my questions is, yes, the study of religion can be a leader in this conversation, but I want it to be reciprocal also. What does slavery and the study of slavery have to teach the study of religion? How might we rethink how we teach and how we do and write and research history, particularly denominational history? What does it mean when we have now individual dioceses, um, you know, like the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, um, the Baptist Church, Methodist churches, all thinking about their historical alliance with slavery and the slave trade. And most recently, what does it mean for us to say, teach the, the Church of England, which recently pledged a hundred million pounds, acknowledging its shameful past and wanting to address past wrong for its investment in the South Sea Company, which was responsible for the transport of some 34,000 enslaved Africans. And knowing that the today's profit they would have yielded 1,361,000,000 pounds from that. Um, so how do we really begin to think about how the history of slavery will change the impact and the way in which we teach authentically with integrity, with truth and honesty in the classroom? One other thing that I think the study of religion can bring is some deep understanding of the ways that we relate to the ancestors. Uh, one of the most basic things that religious traditions do is orient our relationships between people who are living now and people who've lived in the past. But in the context of colonialism, in the context of enslavement, that dimension of religion was often pushed to the margins because the fact of the matter is that colonization and enslavement are ways of breaking kinship. Uh, so it was perhaps inevitable that the religions of the colonizers would wind up shifting to put an emphasis on me and God, rather me and the sacred through the, the thicket of my ancestors. Uh, and, uh, and the study of religion is now kind of catching up to the full complexity of, of religion um, and the centrality of ancestors to that. And that can provide all of us with better tools uh, for thinking ethically about accountabilities to ancestors who suffered profoundly and ancestors who perpetrated atrocities. I mean, uh, Tracy, I just wanna ask you a question. I'm, I'm curious in terms of the authenticity piece because my students often try to push me in terms of, well, what does it mean then to teach authentically, right? And, and part of what I want to suggest or how I've been trained is that, well, we're always questioning the starting point. And so this idea that we are inserting one particular reading of Christianity, right, to overcompensate or to push against another reading, I think is in some ways um, a misnomer. And, and part of how I was trained in terms of thinking through African American, religion, African American religions in, in general, but African American studies also is this idea that you're constantly complicating, right? Um, not necessarily displacing, but complicating, right? The truthfulness of the very origins and the origin stories that we're using um, to, dis to, dis to discuss slavery, for example, or, or discuss Christianity's role in enslavement. Because many people push back and say, well, your authenticity is actually attempting to bury my story, or your authenticity is simply trying to paint one picture. And I think my struggle is how then do we show people that we are trying to bring in multiple ways of reading, right, that are attempting to, again, um, open, open the canon, op open traditions, rather than foreclose them. 
thanks for that question. For me, it's, it's not about curating a sense of history that we give to our students. It's about, I think, courageously being able to boldly walk into that double-edgedness to really step into that authenticity. And it's, it's not always comfortable to be in that space, to give as full and comprehensive as a history as it can, as we can, um, so that it, it doesn't paint itself like this wonderful portrait you know, of history or him, but that it really is messy, that it is painful, and that we can live, and, and we live into the spaces both when it touches our own personal history and when it indicts our own personal history also. You know, how do we model that, you know, I think in authentic ways with, without trying to somehow preserve uh, some kind of pristine history that has never and will never serve us? This, this conversation reminds me of um, also challenges that I have in the classroom. And I think I'm sure all of us do, which is that if to do what we are speaking about, which, which is to uh, challenge, challenge normative uh, assumptions, narratives, to make more complicated histories that are often taught or presumed to be simple. Um, we often encounter then our students that say, well, what do we do with that? Then? What, you know, we're always deconstructing. Um, we're deconstructing, we're showing how, how we can uh, challenge an idea or a narrative, but what do, what do we do with that? Like, what, how do we respond to that? And one, um, one hope that I have in, 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 in my teaching and in our teaching is that we create pathways in, in our experiences in the classroom and even body memory, if we will, if you will, of what it means to think about complexity, not as something to avoid or to be resolved, which is so common the case, but to be embraced as, as generative as generative opportunities. And I just wonder if others of you have those kinds of challenges in the classroom and how you respond to that question of what do we do um, that we can't only, I, I think this is true. I, I will claim that it is wrong for us to only deconstruct, to take apart, to challenge. We have to then help know what does it mean to rebuild or reimagine or engage with the with 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 complexity in different ways and i just wonder i'd love to hear your re re responses to that i really love the way you the, the way you framed that um Morris, because um people often have said to me oh well you're comfortable with all that complexity but i'm not you know, <laughs> uh, you know i i really need to know what i need to do here um, you know, and, and you're really so not helping. <laughs> but but for me, that that complexity is is not about as as Tracy was saying, getting the story right. Okay, it's a complex story, and then that's what that's what we're doing. It's that that provides this opportunity precisely for the kind of accountability that Melissa was talking about, and one is not then coming up with the right story or even the right three interpretations of Paul or whatever, but rather a, a practice of asking, you know, as Terrence is, what, where are we starting from? What are our assumptions? Right. What are the possibilities? How have people interpreted this? Where are they coming from? What are their consequences? What, what are their contexts? What are the consequences of what they're doing? So that this, that this becomes a, a habit of practice of reading, of constantly saying, what complexity am I not seeing? Whose voices am I not heard? What assumptions have I not seen? And again, I can understand how one can get lost in those, in that too, but, but that kind of practice might then cultivate both a kind of sense of humility, um, a kind of sense of courage, and then a sense that Actions do have consequences, so one needs to be careful, but one needs to act. So that's, I don't know. <laughs> that's I love that, love that thing. I might just note that, you know, as a historian, I've long believed, and I'm far from alone in this, within the discipline of history and, and well beyond, 
that the denaturalizing of assumption is not paralyzing, it is in fact empowering. Um, because when we assume that the world that we've inherited somehow had to be as it is, without recognizing that it's the product of choices, it's the product of, uh, it's, a, it's one option among a number of contingencies. Uh, when we recognize that there were paths not taken and there were choices that result in the things that we've inherited, it reminds us that we have an opportunity to shift the arc of history as well. Um, and so you can talk about the complexifying process as uh, disempowering or paralyzing. I can understand you know, how, how that can sometimes be the case, but I think when we recognize that the, the central concern with the contingency of history actually produces the opportunity to act in our present. And that's what I hope we're empowering our students to recognize. That's great, great. I also, I loved your, your notion of reimagining. Uh, one of the things that Dane Perry said in our conversation was, he said, there's an umbilical cord that extends from slavery and that violence to the violence that we see today. And if we cannot reimagine, if I cannot reimagine for my students and for the communities that I feel accountable to and to the ancestors that I'm accountable to, then we will be in a very desperate moment. You know, it, when I'm in the classroom, it's not a moment that's disconnected and I'm teaching the historical violence. It's not disconnected from the contemporary violence that one is experiencing and that we're experiencing in our society. And how do you join those two together when we're trying to train not just scholars, but leaders to be a part of that, that very, you know, messy, violent, complex world? I, I love that. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. I was going to say that's the urgent work, uh, Tracy. I just appreciate yeah. you illuminating that. That's the urgent work of the study of religion. That is praxis. That is the urgent work. That's why we're here. And I just, I, I'm still like savoring your question. Your, your, your question. Whether it's the history of slavery, you have to teach the study of religion. And from that, in that, it's also like, what, what is, what do the enslaved have to teach the study of religion for? Because for people to you know, in spite of a text being, you know, distorted, to be able to utilize a religion and make it their own to survive is one vehicle to survive something as traumatic as slavery. Um, they have a lot to teach us. Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate all that you have, sh have just shared in your um, reflections because it's it's it signals your ability to make those connections um, to help our students really, you know, understand and like a real practical way how this this uh, this resource and religion can be um, uh, how it was applied by people um, uh, centuries ago and how could how it's a contemporary resource for today. And Diane, I would just add that I think when students raise the question, so what do I do with this? I would push back and say, well, I'm not sure you've truly or you embrace that you understand and embody what we've just debated. Because to ask the question, right, to me is really saying, I'm not necessarily comfortable with the logical conclusion or the conclusions of this particular argument. Um, because when, when you understand the material and when you sort of comprehend what's happened, right, you don't ask what to do. You simply, be, you insert yourself in the material, right? When the slaves, like, again, as you all well know, through Rabato and other folk, when they heard yeah. certain narratives, they simply insert it and say, ah, this is what I hear. Here's now, now here's how I act, right? We were just reading Dolores Williams in class today, Sisters in the Wilderness. And it's the whole idea that how do you take what is and simply then engage? And so it wasn't, that she wasn't necessarily looking for an answer to sort of um, black women's oppression, but she was trying to figure out what, what did they do? How did they respond? How do I go to different texts and narratives to discover what happened? And they, and it wasn't simply, but they simply read the material and engaged in and through what they were, even, even in and through the sources that they were given. And to me, that speaks to a way, a way in which people assumed, right, they had the, the right to respond and that their only 
way to stay alive was to respond and respond with courage. And I think sometimes because we're so comfortable in our middle-class ideologies and middle-class sort of comfort zones that we, we ask, well, how, or how do we make this practical? When in fact, if you, you read and you, you engage, the answers are there if you embody it. But what we're really saying, I'm not sure I can do this because it means, it, it might mean my livelihood will change in, in drastic ways. I think you're really right, Terrence. And I would add, there's. I think there are two barriers that um, that, that question signals or two embedded assumptions or structures, I'll say structures. One is this notion that um, all things are fixable through action. Like how do I, what do I do to, to, fix, to fix something? Which I think presumes a, a very um, instrumentalized understanding of education that I think is pretty common now for, uh, and has been now embedded in educational assumptions for several decades now, but it's not inevitable. So I appreciate that comment from you, David, that these structures are not inevitable, but they can feel, feel inevitable. The other, frankly, is white privilege, which is that I need to do, I need as, you know, white people need to do something, like you, you fix something, right? You, you, you take action, you do something that I think is also really problematic to, rather than just sit with what you just spoke about very eloquently, but the implications of what it means to really embody these stories and these narratives. And so the, uh, the, when I was talking earlier about body memory of being comfortable in discomfort, if you will, or accepting discomfort and also accepting complexity as, as, as potentially uh, roots for, for new kinds of moral imagination and generative, um, generative engagement is something that I feel like is, is deeply, deeply part of the, 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 the richness of, of what religious studies can offer. Uh, and needs to offer. Um, I, I just, I wanna make one other quick comment. I'm sorry, I didn't wanna talk so much, but you're, you're commenting and reminded me, Terrence, of your really important connection you made in your, in your um, presentation about how uh, the, no one was writing about uh, understanding uh, Nazism and giving credibility to Nazi uh, uh, ideologies following, following the war. And the comments that you were talking about and beginning with slavery, um, Tracy, reminded me of a, of a really powerful quote by Irving uh, Greenberg who, who spoke after the Holocaust. He said, we can't speak about God anymore without considering the face of burning children. Um, and I thought that's exactly what we need to do about slavery is what does it mean for the study of religion for us to really have to confront the reality of, the, of a world where enslavement was so common and so profoundly uh, ubiquitous as Karen, as Karen identified. And that is back to your comment, Terrence, a change of a starting point. And I think that change of a starting point is really critical for us moving forward as we think about the impact of, this, of these conversations. Hmm. You know, one classic book that raises exactly that question, Diane, is William Jones' book, Is God a White Racist, uh, where he mm -hmm. asks on how to think about the divine in the face of what he called the non-catastrophic character of, of white racism, the ways in which it persists over centuries, always shape-shifting, uh, and the very challenging theological questions that are raised when you see ideas of divine omnipotence in juxtaposition to ongoing shape-shifting oppression. And, and Dan, even Dolores Williams writes, and similarly, mm -hmm. this idea that Blacks have lived in perpetual enslavement, right? So this idea that social death is certain or new or Afro-pessimism, right? We see it in both um, Jones and the works of Dolores Williams, right, 30-odd 30, 30 years ago. Right. We have one question before we shift to the to um, the audience questions. We just have one question for you all to consider, um, which is thinking about the series. What do you see going forward from this series for HDS and for the study of religion? What do you see? We've touched on some of this already, but if you have anything else you want to offer, what do you see going forward for HDS and for the study of religion? It's funny because when we, when we talked about answering that question, it seemed like it was a distinct question. 
Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, particularly the way Dan raised it for us when we were discussing, you know, what we might what we might talk about tonight. But in in some ways, um, what my colleagues have said tonight, <laughs> you know, already in in so many ways addresses the kinds of the list of things um, from you know uh, Tracy's point about what does you know we need to look at what. Um, the study of slavery that teaches us. We need to look at, at curriculum and pedagogy and think about what's going All of the things my colleagues have said seem to me to be the answers that I would have, have, have given in going forward to that. And that includes very much uh, the kinds of suggestions that, uh, that Dan and Terrence and, and others have, have talked about in terms of um, what is reparations? You know, um, how should we think about that? What, what is that going forward? And, Terrence says that so much more beautifully than, um, than I am. That, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm muting now. Now I'm muting. I hope this is just the beginning of one of the things I talked about in my webinar is that we have very few spaces to have these conversations. And so I'm hoping that this is just one of holding space for future conversations and not just virtually, but that our members can come on our campus and engage us uh, in in-person dialogue as well as we begin to have and continue to have these conversations at HDS. I'm hoping that Harvard Divinity School will be a public forerunner for having these difficult conversations, that we will take up a mantle as a space that will hold the moral and ethical principles and values of this institution, uh, its truth uh, to its highest, uh, it, its very task you know, to its highest principles and call upon that, but be a space where we are not afraid uh, to do that. And that we that will be a part of our classroom also, that we will also embrace it. We are teaching leaders that that is a profound vocation for us uh, and, and a profound moment for us to be teaching leaders who will go out and continue this work. You know, we began the webinar with Sweet Honey in Iraq. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. And I wanna be a place and be at a place where we take up as our mantra, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. When we think about our financial obligations and the, um, the economic dependence that our school had on, uh, on these um, systems of slavery, uh, we can think about ways to put our current resources to use in addressing the very issues that this series has raised, including support for students that are working on these issues, uh, including uh, the the resources that might empower faculty to do their own curricular reviews, syllabus transformation, um, to support the ongoing work that Tracy just defined and described. One of the things I would hope for in the study of religion is that this conversation can do the work that a lot of the people responding uh, to this panel have suggested, which is to engage a wider spectrum of religious traditions uh, on, and focus less narrowly on Christianity. One of the really interesting things for me, as I followed the money of Harvard Divinity School, is that the trail led from slave colonies in the Caribbean to slave colonies in the Indian Ocean um, to late 19th century prophets made uh, in imperial ventures in every corner of the globe. And I had a really interesting conversation with my colleague, Terence Sevilla, who works on Islam in the Indian Ocean world about the range of unfree labor um, systems uh, in that part of the world um, at the moment when uh, future Harvard donors um, were sailing their ships uh, there in the 19th century. There's an enormous amount more uh, for me to learn, and I hope we can expand that dialogue. And then for the Divinity School itself, I'm really hoping that we will be on a seedbed of creative thinking about reparation for Harvard as a whole. Um, we are the right place uh, for this one because we are the part of Harvard that is most dependent on endowed well. And two, because as a Divinity School, we have connections to so many of the religious communities uh, that have been one, two, or three steps ahead of us in the work of reparation. Well, thank you. Thank you all um, for, for these comments. And again, that this, this is our question that we will 
uh, keep alive here at the Divinity School and hope that uh, those in the audience will also be um, inspired to bring these kinds of questions to their own institutions. And in fact, many of you um, in your response to our questionnaire, and thank you all, those of you who did respond, we received uh, over 65 responses, which we were so grateful for. And the two questions we asked were, um, what did you learn? What one to three things that you learned from the series and, uh, and how have you, if, if relevant, how have you applied your learning? in your own context. And the responses were incredibly inspiring, um, we found. And I just wanted to highlight four themes in the responses relevant to what people have done with what they've learned. And then I'm gonna open it up back to our colleagues to um, highlight particular responses that they wanted to share relevant to, the, to, the, um, to their own sessions and just maybe make a comment or two about that. So I'll just start by saying that there were four themes that that uh, we gleaned from what people are doing with what they've learned uh, and in ways that were, again, incredibly um, generative for us. Uh, people are looking to their own family histories to discover enslaved as well as slave, slaver ancestors. So several of you commented that the series has inspired you to look into your own uh, family legacies um, in whatever arenas that, the, that those fell and, and what you learned from in that encounter. Uh, the second theme we saw was that people are looking into their religious or other related institutional histories to uncover connections with slavery and the slave trade. Many of you working within religious communities, religious institutions. Others of you though, working in small government contexts uh, relevant to these kinds of questions. Where does the money come from? And just, I wanna quote my wonderful friend and colleague, Dan to say, uh, the key is follow the money, just follow the money back, see what, where, where it leads you. Uh, the third, people actively working within their communities on strategies for uh, and for strategies for an enactment of reparations. So that was there's a lot of really exciting work being done, and thank you for sharing some of those uh, experiences with us. And um, please keep us posted about your about your progress. Seriously, the, this is this is our work as well. And then the fourth, people talking with family, just just individual encounters, people talking with family and friends. Um, about what they've learned in formal ways, either through study groups or through shared participation in the series. We had one respondent who um, was very, <laughs> we all found this very powerful, who uh, requested uh, as a, a birthday present that their family watch this series with this person and that they talk about it and that um, and shared some uh, uh, capacity of what, of what that has yielded, which that we thought was really wonderful and creative. And that, uh, and also in informal ways through sharing new insights uh, from what they've learned. And one comment I'll just close with, relevant to my hope that um, in in our our part of offering this series was that people will feel empowered to realize that their individual agency matters to shape cultures, whereby um, uh, different different kinds of choices can be made. Uh, this person said, I've learned that I can be a positive force by just being aware and perceptive. And I agree because knowledge changes us. Um, and thank you all for your participation in this series and your sharing of your of your of your responses. I'm gonna just turn it over now to 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 our faculty colleagues to say is there anything out of those responses that any of you would like to lift up and respond to as we as we move here toward the, the last quarter of our time together. I had, um, I want to first thank all who wrote in uh, their responses to this series. Thank you for those of you who wrote in that you've been with us week after week. Uh, and we, we are just so grateful for that, that you're taking the time on your Monday evening to be with us. And also thank those of you who couldn't do it every Monday, but took the time to go back and, and view the recordings also. Thank you for your really important affirming comments for the work that we're doing. Uh, I wanted to highlight two of them. One, I wanted to just really emphasize that uh, one of the things that Harvard Divinity School is really framing itself as, as a multi religious uh, context and wanted to just acknowledge that we had a multi-religious audience as well. And for those who, uh, I did the part on the slave trade, I wanted to also just highlight that those Africans who were captive and enslaved were also, also multi-religious during the slave trade. 
uh, several of you identified um, that you are Muslim. I wanted to just, you know, acknowledge that Ramadan Mubarak as we enter into the season of Ramadan soon, but also as Professor Jacob Alupana tells us is that those Africans also were very much, you know, holders of their own indigenous hermeneutics and knowledge of traditional religions that when they came here. So I want them on the one hand, I don't want to take uh, someone asked a question uh, in the in, in the Q&A right now that about the word chattel. And yes, we do know that Africans were used as chattel, uh, objectified as as economy, as 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 objects of labor, uh, but also wanting to those of us who do this work wanting to have humanize them also and not have them only be seen as chattel. So I wanted to also just highlight that uh, that people may not know, again, wanting to uncover some invisible history, that 30% of enslaved Africans uh, from the Middle Passage were Muslim, uh, that they came here from places like Senegal, present-day Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, uh, the Gambia. Uh, many of them came through the, the port of Charleston, and that that they, they disrupted so much of the stereotypes that one wanted to have about Africans, that they were illiterate. We know that wasn't true. We know that particularly our Muslims, those who came who were who were Muslim were uh, literate, who were, they could write in, um, in Arabic. And for those of you who ever have the time, if you ever get to Davidson College, I would urge you to go to the archives and see the work of Omar and Said, uh, who was enslaved, who actually, uh, reproduced the entire Christian Bible in Arabic, and then to protect it, he put his own clothes around it. Uh, so to see that original work, um, and and to really begin to think about the multi-religiosity of of enslaved Africans. Uh, so that was one that I wanted to highlight. Yeah, thank you for those of you who you know who wrote in, who talked about your own religious identities. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight uh, was uh, someone named Tanya. McCallum, who said that she's been with us, you know, every week. We, uh, I really appreciated the work that she is doing. Also, but one of the things that she re reminded us and reminded me is that we are telling a story about the enslaved, the legacy of the captors, the legacy of the owners, the overseers, uh, the one who were were the traders. But she put in that, you know, some of the lyrics of my favorite song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Negro National Anthem, when she says, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, the, thou was brought us thus far along the way. And so just wanting to, to make us clear that it's also, it's about the legacy of slavery, but it's also about the courageous legacy of, of those who were enslaved also, um, that allowed us to you know, to see their humanity as well. And, and, you know, as being part of my favorite song, you know, in being here, the lyrics that keep me going and what I do is we have come over a way that when tears have been watered, we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. And that blood lives in me uh, and, and it empowers the work that I do. And so I want to thank her for reminding us about the descendants of slavery and the enslaved, and also really thinking about another kind of legacy that enslaved people courageously left uh, in in this in this country and in this hemisphere. Thank you, thank you, Tracy. Yeah, I received uh, you know several comments, and I'm grateful for them. But two in particular that kind of just challenged me. One in terms of um, just a reminder that these are human beings who were enslaved, right? And this whole idea that we have to think about enslavement, not simply as, as property, but as human beings who, right, who were confined, who were slaughtered, who were murdered. Um, and, I, I, and I tried to emphasize that point because part, I think, of the, the resistance or a good part of the resistance is the fact that, well, these are people who either deserve to be enslaved or these are simply lazy people Right, who, who went astray, and and no, we want to change the narrative. Say no, we these are human beings who deserve some form of reparation. Um, and then secondly, someone uh, wrote in in a way in which I hadn't thought about this idea that we should think about reparations in terms of our existing liberal vocabulary around equality, equity, and justice. And that I believe she indicated that reparation should um, sort of extend 
or, or serve as a way to think about education, about in, uh, institutional change. And in that just as we talk about equality of opportunity, equal rights, when you talk about this idea of reparation for those who have been harmed, right, and wronged by our society. And so that's something I want to think through a bit more in terms of thinking about reparation as a core principle of, of sort of what we call political liberalism that the person really, I think, implied in their comment. I'd like to pick up two things that were raised in the responses we received and also in the Q&A right now. Uh, and one um, is expressed by I am Carter. What is the timeline for Harvard University to implement and complete this process of repair? And uh, I don't fully know the answer to that question, but what I want to say is that the timeline will be set in large part by all of us. If we take every opportunity we have to talk about the ways in which the work of reparation is intimately connected to our core educational mission and is life-giving um, for the communities uh, to whom we are accountable, uh, then we one by one will gradually move uh, the institution. Uh, and similarly, uh, Dale Mark Benedict uh, raised the question about how we should respond when students ask about other forms of reparation for other harms in addition uh, to enslavement. And my hope would be that the conversation we're having now um, will uh, uh, reach uh, maturity in a way that it can inform uh, reparative work for all of the ways in which the actions of Harvard, its affiliates, and its donors have harmed uh, particular groups of people and ultimately move uh, us to a place where we can, as Melissa, articulate so beautifully so often can think about all of our work in a reparative way. Uh, among the, the viewer responses that grabbed my attention was one from a contributor who noted that the discussion of this history had helped them frame their current understanding of immigration uh, in the present moment and the experiences of new Americans. And that was really gratifying in the sense that this topic was not explicitly raised in our session's discussion. And yet, the viewer saw very contemporary, very live applications and implications of a discussion that names the patterns of othering that bear the marks of really a long and, and sacralized religious discourse. I, I think, I don't want to speak for the organizers, but I think one of the hopes for this series, certainly it was for me, uh, is that participants would feel equipped and empowered to make these kinds of connections and begin these kinds of actions. Uh, and it was wonderfully rewarding to see in the responses evidence of exactly that. I was grateful uh, mm -hmm. for all the demonstrated investment that's already taking place. I can only in, in some ways build on uh, what my colleagues have said, but I really appreciated in particular the way in which um, so many of the respondents or several respondents at least took up of this mantle of the text is saying, the Bible, the biblical text is saying things differently. They heard um, that it, it can be read in multiple ways and they immediately began to put that in, into practice, whether it was as, as teachers or in their own lives or in, in Bible studies and so forth. So again, this notion that there's, that you all have that will to, to take what one leaves and to, to move and to, to see it do positive things in it was just in, intensely um, uh, humbling and gratifying for me. Um, so thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And again, thank, thank all of you who, um, who participated in those responses. Um, we, uh, we'll continue to collect those responses. So if you have further thoughts following this evening, we'll keep that questionnaire open uh, and would, would love, to, love to hear from you. Um, we, we, we could also, we have a few, a few, like five more minutes so we could turn to some of the questions that are, um, that are posed. We've got several, several in the Q&A. A couple of you have already responded to some of them. I, I want to just lift up, a, have a quick response to Steve uh, Laparuz. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly and apologies if I'm not. You, ra you raised, you, ra you made a comment that I, I feel I wanted to respond to. Um, but non-scholars, e.g. believers, although many scholars are also believers, 
um, want religious answers, not complexities of unanswered questions. And I'm going to do something I rarely do publicly. I'm going to take off my religious studies scholar hat and bring on my my faith, my person of faith hat, because I am a scholar who is also a person of faith. And it is through my faith that has actually led me to be to to recognize the power of complexity uh, and the fact that as a person of faith, I can never fully understand uh, or embrace or fully understand the this remarkable, beautiful, mysterious creation that is that is God's handiwork. And so complexity for me is it's synonymous with faith. And then the work in community to think together about what it means to try to live out faith in in uh, in in honest in honest ways. So so I I just want to say from a perspective of a of a believer that I don't think um, religious answers, simple religious answers, really help us get to the depth of faith and what it can mean to um, to imagine a world. Uh, a, a, a better world than we than we fear feel we live in we, that we currently live in. But th thank you for your comment and question. Are there any other questions or comments, Melissa, that you picked up here you wanted to highlight for us, or uh, anyone else in the room? I just what you just said and say amen and second to that. Um, also, as a person of faith, and particularly a person of faith who was a descendant of Africans who were enslaved in this country, to continue to believe in a religion that was utilized as a weapon to uh, try to destroy a people um, and still hold on to uh, the complexities of and the tensions that exist in the religion and find my way through to um, uh, continue to imagine a new world and, and hold on to that division that my ancestors held on to. It requires faith to to, to hold on to that vision and to, to navigate these complexities. So I just wanna underscore and appreciate what you just shared, Diane. Um, and also I just want to underscore this, sure. as, you, as you both were talking this idea, you know, I'm a Christian and I kept thinking of Jesus and the cross, right? And this idea that how can I understand a person carrying a cross for individual and collective sins? It just, in some ways it seems unfathomable. It just seems like way out there and yet, my faith allows me, right, to sit, sit and wrestle with, right, the whole burden uh, of someone loving me so deeply, right, to carry me to a place of rest, to carry me to a place um, that allows me a sense of renewal. And, and while there are all kinds of easier answers to give for why this person carried a cross, I think for most of us, if we're honest, that complexity is confounding. And we're always wrestling with that in our religious spaces. And I think we're just bringing a new vocabulary, right, to how people engage in their ordinary communities all the time. Thank you for that, Terrence. I mean, I, I, I want us, you know, it to be known that we are scholars, but we are real people doing this work. Um, you know, one of the things that Dan said, and I embrace that this is ancestral work. You know, I was brought here to Harvard Divinity School uh, to do the, the to, to uh, teach the traditions of, of people of African descent. I teach uh, those African traditional religions, uh, Yoruba traditions, uh, Santeria, Lukumi, Candomblé, you know, these traditions that in this hemisphere and in the diaspora, you know, uh, Haitian Vodou kept African people alive, uh, kept them close to their ancestors and these ancestral traditions. Um, and close to a sense of who they were before the moment of, of enslavement. And it's, it's not easy teaching those traditions, going through that history. Uh, I also teach uh, James Baldwin, um, the book of Baldwin. And one of the things that always resonates with me, he's writing in the 1960s, he's in an interview and someone says, ask him about his publications. And he said, you know, it's not easy to write in between assassinations. And those of us who are doing this work now, that's what we feel like. I feel like I am writing between assassinations of Sandra Bland, of Tamir Rice, of, of George Floyd, of, of uh, Michael Brown. Uh, and so this it's, it's very real work that we're doing in a very real society. Um, uh, for those of you who ever seen the, 
the film Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash. She said, you know, I'm trying to teach you how to touch your own spirit. I'm fighting for my life and I'm fighting for yours. And that's what I'm doing in that classroom in as holistic a way as I can. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that that may be um, the best ending we could we could imagine. Um, and so uh, I just want to say um, thank you again to all five of our faculty presenters, your, um, your willingness to step into these conversations, the brilliance that you brought to your presentations, the great heart that you bring to your teaching here at the Divinity School inspires all of us. And we're incredibly grateful for your participation in this conversation and we look forward to continuing it in, in a variety of, of ways. We want to also thank those of you who joined us again, uh, both live in these sessions as well as uh, through recording, watching the recordings. And these are all recorded. There was a question in the in the discussion um, that if you go to the website with the um, with the list of of the presentations, you can see links to the recordings for each of these sessions. And this one will be up in a few days once it's transcribed. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. We hope that you will keep these conversations alive in your own context and in your own communities, knowing that these are hard conversations, but hope that you will find uh, grace and courage and, uh, and inspiration to engage with those that you love and those in your communities as we um, are all committed to this work of ongoing justice. And we want to just thank you for joining us. Um, turn it over to you for final final words, Melissa. Thank you, Diane. I just also wanted to just echo my deep appreciation to um, all of you, our colleagues here. I don't take for granted. We don't take for granted that we can have this conversation, particularly in a world today where there's actively people are trying to legislate, you know, make these types of constant conversations outlawed. So. I don't, we don't take for granted that we could have these conversations and speak so plainly and clearly about racism and white supremacy and this as, as urgent acts of the study and pursuit of religion. So I just want to thank all of you um, for this. And it's important that we are here at the Divinity School. Like Dan said, this context is so important. And I think it's because of faith, the last points that we all made, because of faith, that we are able to cast and hold on to the vision of a world healed of racism and oppression. It's a vision that has been passed down to us from those who were enslaved. And it takes faith to be able to hold on to that vision in the world today. So thank you all. And thank you all for all those who've joined us. Sponsors Religion and Public Life, the HDS Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging, the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery Initiative, Harvard X. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.